I come to you today in my purple rain sweatshirt. So you know we mean business in the O'Keefe household. We are talking Sigma DP2 Merrill. pretty obsessed with the Foveon sensor and there's a good reason for it. It is unlike any other sensor out there. There are three generations of it. There's the original Foveon sensor. Well, actually there's probably four generations. There's like a really early Foveon sensor in a Kodak body from like way, 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 way back, like 2000, I don't know, 2004. Then you have the original sort of Sigma bodied Foveon sensors, the DP1, the DP2, the DP3. Then you have the second generation, which is the Merrells, as in the DP2 Merrell, DP1 Merrell, and the DP3 Merrell. And then you have the Quattro sensors that followed, and those are the last iteration that um, went to market. There is rumor of a fourth generation, fingers crossed, uh, a full frame Foveon sensor to come to market that Sigma has been developing. I can only dream. Today we're talking about the second generation, the Foveon Merrill sensor. This sensor does behave differently than the Quattro or the original sensor. And that's what I think is so interesting in all of them. All three generations act quite differently and resolve differently, but at their core, they are a three layered technology, red, green, and blue, just like film, and therefore create a very unique and true to life color rendition that you don't really get with a Bayer because Bayer is just interpreting color on one plane. This is literally receiving color in all three planes. And it's also why you get absolutely insane resolution from what is I think effectively like a 14.14 14 or 15.3 meg megapixel sensor but because it's three of them stacked you are getting like 46 megapixels and it's not a bunch of marketing bs like the resolution of these images is bananas the sharpness the micro contrast I mean we're gonna get into it but let's start at the beginning and end at the end we will start with the year this was released. So this was released in 2012. It has SD cards, which is fantastic. It takes a BP41 battery, which is very easily still purchased online, either original Ricos or the third party options that are available. It has no viewfinder, which is problematic for me. Again, if you've watched my channel for any period of time, you know I need a viewfinder, but I do have a workaround for this, which I will get into. And then it has a shutter that goes from a 30th of a second to one 2,000th of a second. It has a hot shoe on top, also to be discussed. It's like a very industrial clean design. I do have the hood on here. Um, it comes like that. The hood uh, does help with some of the green flare that we'll discuss as well. To be honest with you, I never shot with the hood, but I found this for a steal and I was like, yeah, I just, it looks good, so I'm gonna get it. It has this like really nice sort of dimpled grip on the side. It has, it's like very smooth otherwise, but the grip actually works really well and they have a complimentary thumb grip on the back here. Um, with that dimpled texture. So when you turn it on, you have these very simple options on the back here. And I have to say, I am shocked by how efficient they are. Namely, there's this quick, uh, quick menu dial. I don't know why it says quick or QS, quick service, I don't know. So when you go into that, you get two pages of quick menus. And through those two pages, I get literally access to anything I would ever need at the touch of a button. It's just super, super fast and very efficient. And I just, I just love it. It's a really, really nice way of setting up the camera where you don't have to go into the menus. And I didn't think it would be like that. Just looking at the camera, I thought, okay, this is going to be one of those cameras I have to deep dive into to find anything but it's not. Uh, I set that quick menu up. It's all customizable and it's good to go. And then there's also like very quick access buttons on the back. You have your four-way D-pad. Build quality and ergonomics are pretty, pretty high up there as far as these cameras go. It does come at a price though. This is not a cheap camera, but it's not just because of the way it's built. It is because of the legacy of this particular 
Fovion sensor or any Fovion sensor actually goes for quite a price. But the Merrill in particular has something unique to it. It's not better or worse than the Quattro. I get this question a lot, like which one do you prefer? I use them for different things. I absolutely love them both. And of all the cameras in my collection, including my Leicas, if I had to get rid of something, these Sigmas would be the last to go. There's also a truly filmic way to the way it works with color and the blacks. There's something about the blacks that is very unlike any other digital camera I have shot. So I really appreciate what this camera can do. The difference between Fovion Merrill and Quattro or Original is felt. Um, they are very different and they operate differently. And in addition to that, the options that you can use to process within Sigma Photo Pro, which is a software you have to use if you wanna shoot this in RAW, which is the only way I shoot this because I do not like the JPEGs, reads the files differently and only gives you certain options for Merrill because it's a generation older than the Quattro, which opens up additional features within the, the Sigma Photo Pro software. However, I have learned that I find the editing with these files equally wonderful and easy as I do the Quattro files. I do go about it differently and we can talk about the processing in a little bit, but at the end of the day, the images coming out of this just are insane and they do actually have more sharpness than the Quattro. The Quattro, I would say is more flexible. So if you're looking for a do-it-all camera, I would opt for the Quattro. However, this is always going to be smaller. In my kit, there's room for both. I would never sell one or the other. I, I require them both. I completely neglected to mention that the DP2 Merrill is a 45 millimeter equivalent lens. It's also known to be the sharpest in the lineup. So there's the DP1 Merrill, which is the 28 millimeter field of view, and then the DP3, which I believe is 75 millimeters. I have not shot that one. I would love to try that. I also have a Ricoh GR original. And on my Ricoh GR, I have this GW3, which makes my 28 millimeter field of view uh, lens on the body a 21 millimeter. I love this thing. This is an extremely good piece of glass and it works without any optical flaws on the GR. Well, it so happens that the filter thread matches perfectly on the DP2 Merrill. And so I plug this little baby in and then my 45 millimeter becomes about a 37 millimeter lens, giving me additional options, which completely burst my heart with joy. I do just like on the regular keep a UV filter on this. I use UV filters universally on all of my cameras as lens caps. I don't like lens caps. I lose them all the time. And so that is my way of solving for my general forgetfulness. There is no built-in flash on this camera. However, it does have this wonderful hot shoot that makes me personally super happy because I have gotten more and more into strobe photography. While this will only do TTL with the EF140 from Sigma, which is the proprietary flash, I don't have that one. <laughs> I hope to add it to my collection one day, but they're kind of insanely priced. So I'll just have to like keep scoping. In the meantime, however, I just set this up with either a flash extension cord and one of my really cheap like flashes that I got. I have a, a Luma Pro, I think it's called flash that I got way back in 2008. It is freaking kicking like a rock star. It still kills in the field and it is, you know, double A battery powered little strobe that uh, works really well. So like hot tip, do not be afraid of old flash guns on like eBay or whatever that you can get for $20. Just learn how to shoot in manual mode. I know it sounds like it's intimidating, but it's really not. Um, so I just set this up in manual mode. I put it at its lowest ISO. You can sync this at all shutter speeds. So up to two thousandths of a second, it's a leaf shutter. And I just do the off camera flash and I carry it around. It's a little bit hit or miss, but that's kind of the joy for me of photography. Like I don't want to know exactly how it's going to turn out every time I would get bored. I mean, I, I get that for professional settings. Like you want to be able to repeat and have consistency and all of that but I'm not a professional. And if I were, I wouldn't be shooting these old cameras. I love the joy of the inconsistency and the fun surprise, just like I did with film and strobe is no different. So embrace it, 
have fun. Learn to shoot manual strobe. I can do a whole video on that if you're interested. Put it in the comments down below. But I absolutely love experimenting with different ways of shooting these old cameras. As far as autofocus, oh, I wish I could say good things, um, but I can't. It's pretty slow. I equate the experience of shooting this camera. It's funny because it's like got this insane image quality in this tiny, tiny body. But I say like when you're shooting this camera, you have to forget that it's small and think of shooting not only medium format, but like large format photography. This thing is slow and cumbersome to shoot. So you're just not gonna shoot like sports with a large format camera, right? So. Think of it that way. You're not gonna shoot it with this either. I got one opportunity to go and try street shooting for literally 45 minutes one day in the past month. And so I really scooped that opportunity. And I didn't know about this at the time, but you can actually set an AF limiter in here, which sounds fantastic because I think that was part of my issue. It's just like the minute you touch this, it just goes all over. It's focused by wire and it's really, really overly sensitive. But the focus limiter just makes it so that uh, it limits you to one meter to infinity, which is great for street. So I kind of wish I had known that it might change my opinion on this camera as far as street shooting. The combination of this being a 45 millimeter field of view and the fact that you cannot put this at high ISOs, which we will talk about the ISO capability. It's not as bad as everyone says, but I do prefer to keep this at 100. It just means that you're gonna be limited on the street because you cannot bump your ISO to accommodate for the faster shutter speed to freeze the action on the street and you can't bump your aperture to create that deep depth of field the way that I would with, you know, film or, you know, I'd shoot like at 1600, tri-x, push it, two stops, you know, like all that stuff you can't really do with this camera. So it's just, it's just, I, it's not ideal for street. I really enjoyed it. I had fun. Just, it's not, it's not built for that. But to circle back to the focus thing, it does have face detect, which it's kind of shocking and it does actually work. It's just slow. So you just have to give it some time. Again, you know, in a considered environment, in a slower environment, it's going to do just fine, but don't expect it to be fast and responsive. It's just not. Additionally, it does have manual focus, which in theory is very wonderful, but in practice is a nightmare. It does have a depth of field calculator on the back just to show you like, you know, from infinity to whatever 0.3 meters where your focus is at. And you need that scale because in this area of the LCD, because there is no viewfinder, you, you cannot tell what you're focused on in manual focus. It's a, it's a pretty disastrous implementation. You can actually go to various focusing magnifications, which is great. I'm really glad that they put that in here. I can't remember exactly what it is. It's like four times, eight times, or 12 times magnification. Wonderful. I keep it at four times because when you're going in any further, it's just all digital zoom and it just pixelates and it's a mushy mess and you cannot tell what you're focusing on. Four times is like the closest I can get to an accurate focus, but realistically manual focus on this is just, it's scale focus and hold your breath and pray to the stars. As far as like the PASM, it does have program shift. So you put it into program, you set your relationship between the aperture and the shutter speed. And then when you shift the dial, it will change your shutter or your aperture and then keep the relationship going, which is really, really nice. Pentax does this too. It's such a, a brilliant thing. And I don't know why more cam camera manufacturers haven't implemented that, but it's really, really handy. It also does have a histogram on the back which is absolutely critical because this LCD is junk. It's just terrible. I go on about this in every video. These LCDs on old cameras are just awful and you cannot trust them. You do not know what you're getting from them. The color doesn't look right. The shadows and like highlights look completely wrong. Like you have to rely on the histogram and thank goodness it has one because otherwise I honest to goodness would not know going home if I'd gotten anything worth processing and because the processing is so slow you don't want to sit there and process everything you do have to make select it does also have like blinky flashy things for your highlights so you can in playback see if anything is blown out there's very much limited dynamic range on these foveon sensors it's one of the knocks that they got back in the day but for all the complaining that you'll find online there's way more information here than you would expect based on all that sort of like internet chatter. I don't personally have an issue with the dynamic range. It does again remind me of slide film 
and I love slide film. I love the look. I love the punchiness. I love the crunched blacks. I love the deep, rich colors, and this is absolutely that in a digital body. It also has an inner volometer. Yay. I didn't use it, but it's there. So like I said, the screen is absolutely terrible in this, and it doesn't have an EVF. So the best thing I can recommend is in this little bag. I've had this for a while now, and it's kind of like a throwback to way, way olden times, like even before my time. I remember seeing these things pop up, you know, in Autorama and B&H, and people were all like about these back in the DSLR days, because DSLRs had the same issue, where like you might have an issue seeing the screen. All this is, is a viewfinder. It is very, I don't know, rudimentary, but it works brilliantly and it ultimately gives you like a way way better viewfinder it has magnification in it it's wonderful this one is a camera i'll put the link in the description below it doesn't fit brilliantly on this camera it is definitely like a bit of a compromise but i just require it's not an option for me to be without a viewfinder it is an absolute mandate on my behalf so um, if i can't get something like this on a camera it becomes a major issue for me this one as i said does not fit brilliantly uh, i can make it work but it's less than ideal but again you just make it work right so it fits on like this and here all of a sudden if I can actually do this and give you the experience, you have an absolutely wonderful, uh, this is gonna be hard, but you can't really tell here, but I'll just, just take my word for it. It's killer. It's just so nice to have, and I use it on all my cameras. I actually use it on my video camera as well. But speaking of this LCD screen, this really, really garbage LCD screen, Another really weird thing that I cannot explain is that when I take a picture and it goes into review mode, it looks out of focus on this LCD. It's not, and I've learned to trust that it's not, but when I look at it here, it looks out of focus until I go into playback mode and I can then, you know, zoom into the image and see that it's not. I don't know why, but these old screens just at the point of capture, just they look out of focus, but there you go. They're fine. Don't worry about it. Another knock on this camera, which I cannot totally explain. It's like a very weird thing, but it, it, it's an outdoor camera. I don't use this very much indoors. Well, one, because the ISO. So let's just capture the ISO piece right now. It goes up to ISO. What did I say? 6,400. You just never going to use it there. I do use it up to 400 in really pressing cases where I don't mind flipping to black and white. I'll use it at 800, but it is, it, it really does deteriorate the image. You do start to get color banding and the saturation of the file gets all wonky. It's just really hard to bring back to life. So I keep this at ISO 100, just like I do all my other Sigma cameras. Shockingly, actually the white balance and auto on this is totally usable. Uh, I don't have an issue using that 99.9% .9 of the time. But when I'm indoors, it gets crazy in mixed lighting it just does not know what's going on and it becomes very temperamental this has literally the worst battery life of any camera i've ever shot minus maybe like the original dp series it just eats batteries alive i carry six with me you just need to they are very small batteries so it's not that big of a deal so we're going to take a very quick moment to thank the sponsor of today's video wasabi power they are the ones creating basically all the batteries that I have in that insane battery drawer in my room because I, you know, buy all these old cameras and these old cameras come with the original batteries that can no longer retain power. If you need batteries for your old cameras, just go to wasabipower.com backslash two cameras with a 15% discount in the link down below. Other like small knocks, there's no IBIS on this. It would be nice, but again, it would probably increase the size of the camera. I have this fantastic really, really tiny tripod that I used with this. And it's like my favorite tripod. I love this tripod. It is dinky AF and um, you definitely don't want to put any kind of a payload on it. But this thing is so light, you can just carry that tiny tripod, which fits in my purse with this and a hell of a lot of batteries. There's no level on here, but there is a grid uh, that you can overlay to just try to find your, your levels. 
and it has like a nine point autofocus system. Again, the autofocus is like not the draw of this camera. There is no option for a shutter release cable on this, which I think actually is a bit of a miss. I, I kind of wish they did do that. It would have been a really nice addition. That being said, there is a self timer. So like when you do want to set it up for a longer exposure and you don't want to have any shake, you just put it into a two second or 10 second timer mode hit the shutter and then, you know, wait for it to go. It will take its nice long exposure and then, you know, you're done. All right, so let's talk post-processing because that's a big part of these Sigma cameras and the Sigma experience in general. So we're gonna dive into my computer and take a look quickly at how I kind of post-process these X3F files because like I said, I do not like the JPEGs out of these cameras none of them and so i absolutely favor the x3f i know a lot of people really like the jpegs that's great i'm super happy for you makes your life a lot easier they just aren't for me i can process the jpegs to you know better my liking but the x3f files just have so much rich awesome incredible detailed information that i just like i could drink them all day all right so we are in sigma photo pro here um latest version which i it's up here in the upper right corner. And we are just going to go into this one image that um, I shot. And this is a pretty high dynamic range situation that, you know, might usually be called a bad image for a Foveon sensor to capture, but I thought it did really well. So I thought it'd be fun to just take a look. I usually have like a base setting that I use here. You can see I just pulled down the exposure, did a few things. Um, but in general, I bring my Luma and Chroma all the way down. I've got my shadows down here, sharpness, light, da da da. But I'm going to reset this. And then in the drop down, I'm just going to go back to original. Sigma Photo Pro as a software is, you know, slow. Um, and there aren't things like copy and paste for your settings. So you do want to save a preset if you find an adjustment that you like that works generally. So what I've got here is a drop down full of all kinds of different settings I've saved over time. Um, but at the bottom here, I have a uh, full sun. So this is like for high contrast situations and that'll just be my baseline that I work with. And you can see up here in the upper right, it's loading those settings and that is the time that it takes for the software to apply it. So now we have a base setting and it's just exposure is down, contrast is up a little bit, shadows all the way up, highlights all the way down. That's kind of the most telling piece of this. Um, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bring the exposure up a little bit more. Um, I'm gonna bring my chroma and luma down and that just gives it a lot more of the micro contrast, uh, kind of takes away any processing that the software is doing. And so, yeah, let's come up on the exposure. And that's looking a lot better already. And I might just more or less, you know, leave it there. Like that to me is a pretty good baseline. I do always set my white balance to daylight and then my color mode to standard. And universally, these files are too cool and green for me. So I'm always going uh, into the ambers and the magentas. If I reset this, you will see how much cooler it is. It's not bad, but I do just tend to like things on the warm side. So I am always starting at this point of three and 2.5 for my ambers and magentas. I'm gonna export this as a TIFF 16-bit file to then further process in Lightroom. So we will just quickly now jump over to Lightroom. Yeah, so now we are going to take this image and I'm basically gonna just do very minor things. I'm gonna add a little bit of the magenta. So just change the tint. Well, first I'm gonna do my Sigma Photo, um, or Sigma Quattro H preset, which is otherwise known as just my OMTC preset. I developed it for the Sigma originally, but um, I use it for everything now. And I usually just have the intensity down to about 50% on this. It is very strong otherwise. I'm gonna add some magenta in, take some of that yellow down um, just to cool it off slightly and I could bring my shadows up just to play with it but I actually quite like it punchy so I'm gonna bring my highlights down a little bit bring the exposure up a little bit and that's pretty much it oh, I'll play the yeah I'll bring my whites down and bring my highlights up a little bit and that is about all I would do for that image okay so I did want to mention one thing about um, these Merrill files because unlike the Quattro's 
Um, there are certain areas of Sigma Photo Pro that are not available, and one of them is how you deal with micro contrast. So one thing I did not know until, you know, fairly recently was in working with these uh, files, the Merrill files, they really are super, super sharp, and that can be really unflattering to skin, especially when you add in that micro contrast. So here's an image of just a little wee one. I'm gonna apply one of my presets here. Uh, I have one that's just like more of soft color. So I'm gonna put that on, and we're gonna see this is going to change the settings. It's gonna be um, quite soft. I mean, probably too soft and too bright, yeah. So we will take this and bring it down um, a fair amount. And then I would bring the contrast up too a little bit. So bring that up. And then this is getting to a nice place, but you can already see like that micro contrast is pretty strong in her face. And you know, she's just a little one. So I'm gonna go over to the chroma and luminance and bring this up a little bit. So it actually reduces some of that micro contrast and that is gonna soften her face. And this is usually my settings for like my age, but she's so young that I'd actually bring a little more detail back um, and bring the luminance down a notch. So this to me is like kind of a perfect starting point. Then I can take this back to Lightroom in that 16-bit TIFF and you know just refine the color a little bit and the contrast, but this to me is a super working file. Um, if you want to see any more about how I deal with these X3F files in general, whether it's the Quattro or um, you know my post-processing in Lightroom, you can hop over to this other video here. All right, so there you go. That is a Sigma DP2 Merrill. Can I recommend it? Like I said, just no. Like, don't do this unless you are really willing to commit to the process of using these cameras. They are slow, temperamental, limited use cases, but as someone who just shot this exclusively for well over two weeks, I absolutely loved every minute of it. I am happy to put in the work because the outcome is so darn good and so unique. And ultimately, like this whole channel is my search for what is different. I'm not interested in having a camera that is just like the same experience as every other camera, which is kind of all modern cameras today. That being said, a viewer out there who got this after I spoke about it and uh, said it was just too much for him. And I totally understand that. Like this is definitely not a camera for everyone. There are so many little grievances that could equate to just ultimate frustration for 99% of people. For me though, it just, it just hits. So there we have it. That is the Sigma DP2 Merrill uh, joyous, <laughs> crazy, insane camera. I really, really hope they come forward with another Foveon sensor. I am so eager to see where Sigma goes with this. I think Sigma is the only camera manufacturer out there taking any risk at all. So I just really appreciate them. I mean, I would put Pentax in that category. I wouldn't say risk though. They're just kind of repurposing old bodies and doing things that their customers are asking for, like the monochrome, which is stellar. So hat tip to Pentax, hat tip to, hat tip to Sigma. Keep doing what you're doing. And in the meantime, I'll keep doing what I do. The next thing we're gonna be reviewing is actually a lens. I've never shot a tilt shift lens and I have the opportunity to use one. So we're gonna discuss, we're gonna review, and we are going to be doing it on Instagram for the next two weeks. So go follow me at One Month Two Cameras and then come pop back over here uh, for a new video. Until then, thank you again. And I will see you. I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you, bye.